Get ready to rumble. Chilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast welcomes James T. Moody, economist and business owner, author of the new book, The Ladder Out of Poverty, The Great Society Promised to End Poverty in America. It did not work. Here's a solution that will work. And Jim Moody, thank you for joining us today on the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. You make a point in the beginning of the book, and I'd never heard this discussed before, private versus public sector and poverty. I think this is important for people to consider. Would you elaborate? When I started digging into poverty, I uh, crunched every number I could find from the government and other sources, spent a long time, and I was rather confused myself. I had been asked by a local politician, why has the poverty rate not declined since the Great Society started? They've pumped all this money into the top, nothing's coming out the bottom, really. They haven't put a dent in poverty. And so I made a kind of a important discovery on my behalf of dividing poverty into transient poverty and chronic poverty. Transient poverty is caused by job loss or recession, things like that. There are many causes for it. But chronic poverty always has a single cause. So I started studying chronic poverty because it's easy to find the cause and therefore easy to solve the problem. Then I also discovered that Poverty is isolated in the private sector. People in the private sector make about half what the public sector salaries are. Public sector pensions are enormous. That's that's where I started. And that led me into finding uh, about six or seven causes of chronic poverty. It is um, a fascinating study of considering the terms, first of all, that we look at this, we need to understand what capitalism is and what it is not. Let's talk, first of all, about usable goods and manufacturing as we look back on the history of the country. When did that become a boom and how did that affect the nation? It's a shame that in a country that invented capitalism, we're not able to properly define it. Mm. Ask anyone, even an economist, what is capitalism, and they're likely to just say it's free markets, it is not simply free markets. Barter societies in the Middle East are free markets, and they're mired in poverty. Capitalism is a self-perpetuating, designed economic system that reduces prices and thus reduces poverty. Capitalism reduces poverty, and socialism increases poverty. That's evident, but what are the mechanics of that? So I thought in my first two or three chapters, I should explain what capitalism and socialism were, properly define them. It's hard to solve a problem when you don't have good definitions. For instance, if you're a detective trying to find a murderer and you have one witness defines the murderer as a tall man, the next witness defines him as a white Caucasian with a a, a tattoo on his arm, that's a better definition came up with some better definitions for wealth and poverty. And the wealth of a nation is its amount of usable goods, just as poverty is a lack of usable goods. Poverty in a society is caused by a lack of clothes and foods, etc. If the supply of those usable goods is low, naturally there's not enough to go around and the prices go up. If there's a large supply of usable goods, the prices come down and more people can afford them. And as the supply of usable goods rise, prices and poverty decline. It's not the salary that we pay to a factory worker that's important. It's the millions of shoes, hammers, and vaccines they make that build wealth for our nation. So our nation, the United States, grew to be wealthy because we created far more usable goods than other nations. 
And when the United States began, we were essentially paupers, just like in Europe. And in the 1790s, we made our homes with log trees, mud houses, grew our own crops, hand-forged our tools, made our clothes. By 1914, we were the richest people on earth. And what happened? It was capitalism, unhindered by taxes or government interference. We didn't even have an income tax until 1913. The basic structure of capitalism was created by uh, Cyrus McCormick, but there were about four or five other brilliant factory owners that added to its power. Chronologically, it started with Eli Whitney, who invented the cotton gin. Of course, uh, clothing prices plunged. Even by the, his death, we were exporting textiles. It wasn't the cotton gin, though, that added power to capitalism. It was his invention of mechanical engineering, which uh, prompted the uh, next generation of manufacturing machines. And one of those machines was the Reaper by McCormick. But McCormick's Reaper was complex, and if it broke down, the farmers didn't understand it, and they couldn't repair it. And uh, McCormick had a lot of trouble traversing the country and trying to make sales and parts and repairs. And he solved that problem with a very creative idea. He set up a system of distributors and shared considerable profit with those distributors. And they took over all sales and service and repairs. And McCormick was smart enough to send farmers back to the distributor. He said, you have to buy from your respective distributor. They tried to go around the distributor, Mm -hmm. but he wouldn't allow that. And other factory owners saw the success of that, and they all set up distributorships, and they went one step further and added another layer of profit to include retailers. And in the 1850s, retail sales exploded. Every town in America had a general store, and women came in, buy their food there, bought their clothing. Uh, they weren't paupers anymore. They could buy whatever they needed. That's, uh, that's what got it started. And then Andrew Carnegie brought the price of steel down four times so that uh, manufacturers of home goods got affordable products into everybody's home prices plunge across the world and that's when the rest of the world started looking at us saying that we were the land of opportunity and getting wealthy contrary to popular opinion it was the sharing of profits and not greed that made america great it was the sharing of profits that made ca- capitalism so powerful everyone who was involved in the sale of a product was guaranteed to make a profit That's what made it so powerful. Henry Ford came along later, and he brought the price of cars down to every family. Even poor families were buying cars. Then Lyman Stewart, who owned and founded Union Oil, defied his own board of directors to sink profits into petrochemical engineering inventions. And by the 1950s, his petrochemical engineers had created 5,000 products that we use and buy every day, all derived from each barrel of oil. Uh, I think it's important right now. The derivatives of oil are gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, bunker fuel, heating oil, mineral oil, kerosene, solvents, benzene, surfactants, distillates, etc., etc. And each derivative has its own supply and demand market. That's why... 2021, when Biden cut off every source of oil within his jurisdiction, oil prices doubled, but jet fuel tripled. The derivatives created all kinds of products. Nowadays, the uh, oil industry tells us that there are 6,000 products derived from oil, and that's why when oil goes up, inflation goes up. It's really oil that's driving the inflation. In fact, there's some pretty evident proof of that. When Biden took office, for 13 years prior to that, inflation averaged 1.4%. In his first week in late January of 2021, Biden cut off every source of oil in his jurisdiction. And in the very next month, three things happened. Our domestic production of oil dropped from 13.1 million barrels per day 
to 9.7 million barrels per day. The price of oil doubled from $55 to 110, and the monthly inflation rate leaped from 1.3% to 9.6%. It was an immediate effect when oil prices went up. I just don't think it's uh, the government spending as most economists say it is. That's just a lot of groupthink, in my opinion. For instance, a rich person doesn't offer to pay $4 for a carton of milk when the price is 3 But if there's a shortage of milk, he'll bid up the price. It's the shortage of goods or increase of cost of usable goods that causes inflation. And inflation causes poverty. Now, let's talk about how that would be linked to socialism, because we we took a wrong turn. Things were going very well. You referenced 1914, and then in the 1920s, we had a crash, and Roosevelt was standing by at the ready. Our standard of living peaked in the roaring 20s because capitalism was allowed to grow without any interference from taxes. For instance, uh, one person earning the average wage of $1.24 an hour could pay off their home in five years, purchase a vacation home, pay that off, and support a family of five all the way through college. Then go talk to your grandparents or look what they did. Vacation home boom occurred in the 20s in all our resort towns. And if you think about our standard of living now compared to that, average income in the private sector when I wrote the book a few years ago was 45,000 a year. Imagine trying to pay off your home in five years with that kind of an income and then buy and pay off vacation home in three years. That's how much lower our standard of living is because of taxes. What The taxes that you're referring to were started by Roosevelt. Our taxes were very, very low. For instance, Roosevelt, when he came along, he increased the lowest income tax bracket from 4% to 24 percent that's poor people in the highest bracket he raised it to 94 percent all that reduced what we could afford to pay and the corporate taxes he raised to 40 percent increased the price we had to pay that's nonviolent socialism uh, at full throttle we became a hybrid capitalist socialist nation and our standard of living has been declining ever since every increase in taxes our standard of living lowers because it affects the usable good price the shilling show unleashed podcast continues in a moment our guest is james t moody rob shilling shilling show media.com is your one-stop shop for websites audio and video production and photography shilling show media.com will take your project from conception to completion Shillingshowmedia.com is reasonably priced and highly professional. Need a website for your business? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Need a video created or edited? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Have a photography or graphic design project? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Shillingshowmedia.com is your one-stop shop for websites, audio and video production, and photography. Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. That's Shillingshowmedia.com. Get your fix. Shilling Show Unleashed. The Shilling Show returns. The book is The Ladder Out of Poverty. We're talking with author James T. Moody. I want to go to some of the issues that have come up in more recent years, and this one is astounding to me. The cap and trade going back to Southern California, the first rule in 1994. What was the scheme, and what happened to the factories? My degree is in economics, but my career was in gas physics. I owned a uh, gas physics uh, met weights and measures test and repair facility in Southern California here. And uh, when the National Clean Air Act happened, they authorized states to make their own uh, rules. And that was a huge mistake because in California, they started the first air quality district right here in Southern California. And it was called Southern California Air Quality Management District, SQAMD. My company was chosen as the source for testing of the factories who had to comply with the rule. The rule started as uh, Rule 1142. Think about that for a second. The new district had made 1,141 (laughs) rules before they 
got to the, mm. the cap and trade rule, and then they layered 1142 with uh, reclaim rule, which added the cap and trade feature, and that required the factories to measure their natural gas that they were burning, and the reclaim aspect required them to reduce that by 75% over five years. Factories would shut down boiler number one to comply with the first year rule and boiler number two or whatever, and they just kept shutting down more and more equipment to comply with the rule, and then they'd finally close. Near the end of the five years, the SQAMD decided to come up with a new list of factories. Their original list was all the factories that had equipment that burned 10 million BTUs or more per hour. And then their new list that they came up with was factories that burned equipment 5 million BTUs per hour. And then by the time they were done lowering that range, they kept including smaller and smaller factories. The compliance went all the way down to 75,000 BTUs per hour. That's residential size. So they covered every factory in the basin had to comply with this rule and reduce their gas consumption by that much. Factories were closing. On January 1st, 1994, when they first implemented the rule, eight factories announced they were going to close. So factories were closing throughout the rule, and by the time I retired and sold my company in 2006, I'd counted over 1,200 factories had closed out of about 1,800 factories in the basin. They're still closing. During that time, also, the Chinese were smart. They have always had import-export people here to buy things that they need. Uh, Everything's made in America. Must have American goods. (laughs) And so I got lots of calls from uh, Chinese people looking for factories that were closing. And they were making offers for the manufacturing equipment to the factory owners. It's very difficult to move old heat treat equipment, furnaces, ovens. They're very brittle. It's risky to move them. The Chinese didn't care about that. They offered top dollar for the machinery. They bought every piece of machinery that our factories sold. And it's not true that we outsource jobs to China. They didn't want anything except our machinery. And so it made sense for the Chinese. They could then make the very products that we were already buying with the equipment we were using to make it with. And that's when our, our balance of trade started to get way out of whack. We had a positive balance of trade with them, and then it just has been going up ever since. That's why we buy so much from China now, was because of that one rule. Now they want them to take that rule on a national basis. I heard recently force factories Mm -hmm. to report greenhouse gases. It's exactly the way the California rule started. If we allow the WEF or the Democratic Party to require factories to uh, report greenhouse gases, we're in big trouble. And there's no such thing as a greenhouse gas either. You know, as I told you, we were experts in gas physics, and we were wondering about this whole greenhouse gas thing ourselves. So we measured carbon dioxide. It cools 20 degrees, which is about the amount the atmosphere heats up every day. It cools 20 degrees in less than four minutes. And then we, we had a proving room, uh, which is uh, required by NAIST for testing. And we flooded our proving room with uh, humid air with all the other gases that come along with it and tested that. And that cooled about one degree every 32 minutes. So that's about 11 hours, not coincidentally, matches the cooling rate of our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide cools as fast as our atmosphere and the sun allow it to cool. Mm -hmm. It can't possibly retain heat from day to day. Even the gases in our atmosphere, all of the gases cool uh, in less than day to day. It's impossible for a gas to retain heat from day to day. No gas does that. So this is all just something else the left has made up to get everybody to shut down factories, and that's how it began. And that's their goal. They want to shut down all the factories and shut down natural gas burning. Another thing that carbon dioxide is essential to photosynthesis. 
photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus sunlight plus H2O. That's it. Without photosynthesis, and what it does, uh, it converts carbon dioxide into glucose and the other organic matter that make plants. In uh, Britannica, I found a definition by a physiology scientist that uh, claim that if photosynthesis did not exist, most organic materials on Earth would disappear. And here's another thing. When we burn methane, natural gas, the products that come out of that are carbon dioxide and H2O. Those are the building blocks of photosynthesis. So when we burn natural gas, it may be even good for the environment. We should look, Jim, also to the ways that you have listed at the end of the book, at least a few of them, to reduce poverty and get out of the mess that we're in. And one of them that you talk about almost immediately is the broken family and we, how we have actually encouraged that with public policy. Uh, we paid unwed mothers mm-hmm. to be unwed mothers. And there were, there were some politicians on the right that complained about that when that happened. If you're a unwed mother, you get paid by the number of children you have. There are a lot of men running around and are trying to get women pregnant so that they can make money. It's just a terrible way to do it. There's something else we're doing which is really foolish, and you point this out, it's been bothering me for years, uh, using food to fuel our cars. Yeah, they started uh, on the ethanol kick uh, using a large percentage of our corn crop went into ethanol production. You know, that was a a chronic poverty issue that I took up. They're using sugar cane now, diverting away from sugar products to make ethanol. So that's kind of a silly approach. What about the regulations and the administrative state? That's got to add a huge layer to the poverty problem. You can see what the administrative state did in the cap and trade rule. That's a classic example of bureaucrats. Those guys at the AQMD are not scientists. They're bureaucrats, bellwether bureaucrats that were giving the assignment to clean up the air. Well, the jurisdiction for that was CARB, California Air Resources Board, and the national law. So when they made the SQAMD, it did not have the jurisdiction over smog. And so these guys had to find a way to justify their bureaucracy and their salaries. And so they picked out natural gas, and they knew carbon dioxide was harmless. They even said that publicly in the beginning. So they went after uh, the trace amounts of nitrogen Mm -hmm. that are in uh, natural gas. It's just one part per 1,700, something like that. And the public didn't really know that was harmless. But they started going after factories on that basis. And then later, when that was so successful, that's when they decided, okay, if we got away with shutting down natural gas using uh, nitrogen, we can do it with carbon dioxide. And that's when they switched naming carbon dioxide as the culprit. They switched to saying that it causes uh, global warming. And that's why they were going to try to cut uh, carbon dioxide because they had already declared it harmless in burning our our stoves and whatnot. But that's a classic example of an administrative state uh, that cost us our manufacturing in our nation. Do you have any signs of hope uh, as you look forward to the economy in the United States? Are we doing anything to get out of this situation? When I started looking at chronic causes of poverty, there's one that really popped out as the cause of poverty in our country. And it's a shocker to hear it, but it's Social Security. Mm. Social Security uh, taxes 15.3% of our income. That's most of the federal income tax. Then they have the gall to pay us back a Social Security pension that is below poverty level. It's below poverty for the median pension. And the rest of the pensions are very close to poverty. So with the 15.3% tax, they're taxing away our excess savings and then locking us into poverty when we get old. So I began to wonder, okay, 
why don't we do what Milton Friedman told us to do 50 years ago? Privatize Social Security. And no economist was talking about that. I thought, well, he kind of mentioned it once in a while. And I thought, well, let's figure it out. So I logged all of the Dow Jones closing averages on December 31st from 1975. The Dow Jones was 632. In 2020, the Dow Jones was 28,538. That's a lot of growth in that yes, in equity is. funds. So what if we had added an ever increasing investment each year in addition to the six thirty two? What if we then added our employer added also each year our fifteen point three percent social security Medicare tax into our own private equity fund? I took the example of a low income worker with an average lifetime taxable income of eight dollars and twenty cents an hour. Had he paid his Social Security Medicare tax into an equity fund, he would have retired with over a million dollars. Wow. I mean, you don't even have to understand what stocks are. So I think that's what we should do, and the Republicans have given up on that idea, but that is the one good idea that would nearly end poverty in America. It's a remarkable series of events that led us to this place, and it's not so hard to get out if only we had the political will. James T. Moody, if people want to get a copy of your book, The Ladder Out of Poverty, or to follow your other work online, tell us how, please. Well, I'm on Amazon. Pen name is James T. Moody, and it's spelled M-O-O-D-E-Y. Thank you so much for joining us today. Very insightful. Thank you so much. That concludes another edition of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Visit us online at shillingshow.com where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time. <laughs>